sucked out of your body for three four hour long dialysis sessions every single week. This past week at my EMT shift, I asked my routine dialysis patient, we'll call her Kendra, about how she gets through her three four hour long dialysis shifts every single week. What do you mean how? Kendra asked. I don't really have a choice, do I? Kendra has been one of my dialysis patients for the last six weeks. To me, 12 hours a week of hemodialysis, where a machine filters all of the blood in my body, would seem like an eternity. To Kendra, however, who has been a dialysis patient for the last four years, this was just her weekly reality. Kendra suffers from stage four chronic kidney disease, or CKD for short, and according to her doctor, has less than 10 years left to live if she doesn't receive a donor kidney transplant. From the outside, Kendra's situation may seem dire, but it's not rare. In fact, what if I told you that every 24 hours, there are 360 people in the US alone who begin dialysis treatment just like Kendra? What if I told you that CKD is the ninth leading cause of death in the United States, killing more than breast or prostate cancer every single year? Or that one in seven US adults have CKD, but 90% of them don't even know they have it until they have to start dialysis. As we begin talking about CKD like this, it starts to become pretty alarming how little most of us know about our kidneys and about CKD. When we go to the doctor for our annual physicals, we know to ask about things like our blood sugar or our blood cholesterol, but when was the last time you asked about your kidney function? Why is CKD so under-discussed? So before I go any further, let me take a step back and let's first talk about what exactly CKD is. CKD, or chronic kidney disease, is the gradual decline in kidney function over a long period of time, usually years and often decades. There are five main stages of CKD shown up here. And where stage one CKD means your kidneys are still functioning at 90% ability or more. Stage two is mild CKD, where your kidneys are functioning at about 60 to 90% ability. Stage three is moderate CKD, where your kidneys are functioning at 30 to 60% ability. Now stage three is when most people start realizing that they might actually have the disease, once they've usually already lost about 50% of kidney function. Stage four is severe CKD, with only 15 to 30% of kidney function left. And finally, stage five is end-stage CKD, with less than 15% of kidney function remaining. So, to further understand why exactly CKD is under-discussed, let's first think about one illness that is pretty well-known, and that is discussed well. Let's take coronary artery disease, a type of heart disease, for example. Coronary artery disease and other types of heart disease often present with some sort of poor circulation, pain in the upper arms, or chest pain at the beginning. Most of us know that we need to seek immediate medical attention if we experience chest pain or pain in the upper arms, poor circulation, or other similar symptoms. Unfortunately though, CKD is not like this. There are very few distinguishing symptoms of CKD at the early stages, resulting in people not really knowing what to do until the later stages when they need dialysis. Now, let's take breast cancer as another example. Many diseases like breast cancer also often show their hallmark signs at an early stage and are significantly better known to patients with family histories of breast cancer or other predispositions to the disease. Annual breast exams are commonplace, and because of such preventive medicine, breast cancer is diagnosed at stage one in 62% of diagnoses. Unfortunately, again, CKD is not like this. Unfortunately, again, CKD is not like this. Unlike, C unlike coronary artery disease, there are very few symptoms of CKD that are readily distinguishable at the early stages. And unlike breast cancer, there are very few awareness and prevention-based efforts to actually stop CKD before it gets serious. For example, consider that a CKD patient might initially have some sort of nausea or fatigue or weakness or other similar symptoms. I'm sure we've all felt some sort of nausea and fatigue and weakness from time to time, but that doesn't necessarily make us think that we have CKD. Given such symptoms, there are very few ways to identify CKD at the early stages, and there are very few ways for people to know that they might actually have CKD until the later stages, when blood is in the urine 
the lower limbs begin to swell, and more serious and noticeable symptoms begin to develop. Fortunately, though, this is because our kidneys are pretty resilient. With one million functional units called nephrons in each of our two kidneys, the decline in kidney function is often slow and gradual. This slow, gradual decline in kidney function means we have more cold-like symptoms at first, followed by more severe, alarming, and noticeable symptoms later. This is why most patients don't usually realize that they have CKD until they've reached stage 3A or 3B of the disease, when about 40 to 60% of their kidney function has already been lost. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, this, unfortunately, although there are tests for CKD, just like for breast cancer, they're infrequently used or requested by patients. Nephrologists recommend estimated glomerular filtration rate tests, or EGFR tests, about every 12 months. But most of us just don't know what these tests are on the same level as tests for breast cancer or heart disease or other similar tests. Because of this, patients usually get diagnosed late because they get tested late. And because of this late diagnosis, patients usually don't understand that they have CKD until they've already lost about 50% of their kidney function. The lack of awareness of CKD and the lack of education about the symptoms of CKD, in addition to the lack of prevention and screening-based efforts to actually combat CKD before it becomes serious, are some of the prevailing major important factors in the prevalence of CKD in the United States today. However, our understanding of why CKD is important does not stop here. In order to really begin appreciating why CKD is under-discussed, we need to dig a little bit deeper into the monetized aspect of the disease. So, like most problems, let's try to follow the money. In the US, CKD is an enormously, massively profitable business, with treatments for CKD like dialysis worth over $80 billion a year and growing at about 6% annually. Unfortunately, such a big market can become pretty troubling when large for-profit companies like Davida Inc. and Fresenius Medical Care hold about 70% of the market power, creating major conflicts of interest and in actually informing patients about whether or not they have CKD and actually preventing dialysis in the first place. Companies like Davida and Fresenius monopolize the dialysis market, boasting market capitalizations in the tens of billions of dollars and with annual operating profits of over two billion each. These enormous market capitalizations and annual operating profits are largely made possible by suboptimal treatment practices that don't put patients first and that limit awareness and prevention of CKD. Simply put, Davida and Fresenius, as for-profit companies, um, have a vested interest in their bottom line. And in order to protect their sacred line, they often resort to biased, selective medical guidance that is not in the best interest of patients, and that minimizes awareness and raising, uh, raising preventive efforts to actually combat CKD. For example, consider that transplant, uh, transplant referrals must be made by dialysis clinics for every single patient, with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services noting that dialysis facilities have to make these transplant referrals. Unfortunately, though, many for-profit companies like Davida and Fresenius fail to do a proper job in educating, their, in educating their patients about what exactly a kidney transplant can do for them and the superior prognosis with a kidney transplant. Because of this, many patients join the transplant waiting list late, and at for-profit clinics have a 17% lower chance of actually receiving a deceased donor kidney. Fortunately, many public officials have started to notice these massive conflicts of interest and attempted to resolve them through clear policy and stronger regulation. In 2018, a group called Californians for Kidney Dialysis Patient Protection hoped that through Proposition 8, um, a lot of these problems would begin to be solved. Proposition 8 would have required dialysis clinics to refund any money in excess of 115% of dialysis costs back to insurance companies and hopefully this would have trickled down to patients as well. At the time, and even now, dialysis companies had and have very little incentive to actually properly staff their clinics with any more than the bare minimum requirement of medical professionals to actually keep their clinics functioning because they want to minimize their operating costs and maximize profits. Davida and Fresenius, through this, 
um, were able to, because of this, Davido and Fresenius were able to lobby over 80, over $99 million against the initiative, compared to the only $20 million that was able to be raised in support of the initiative through grassroots efforts. Although there was a lot of discussion about whether Proposition 8 would have capped dialysis profits too much, it's needless to say that because of such massive lobbying efforts, Davida and Fresenius were able to make sure that Proposition 8 did not get passed, with about 60% of voters voting against the bill. Unfortunately, this was not the only instance of heavy lobbying efforts by both Davida and Fresenius against bills prioritizing patient safety over Dallas's profits. In the four years from 2016 to 2020, Davida and Fresenius spent about $200 million in lobbying efforts against similar bills. In addition to such lobbying efforts, Davida and Fresenius also have spent hundreds of millions of dollars in the last few years in settlements for major lawsuits instead of simply using this money to better prioritize patient safety and care within their clinics. In 2015, Davida paid about $450 million to settle allegations that they overbilled Medicaid and Medicare for seven years from 2003 to 2010. And more recently, in 2018, Davida paid about $400 million in wrongful death lawsuits, facing allegations that their dialysis treatments and their dialysis clinics directly resulted in cardiac arrests and deaths for three patients shortly after their dialysis treatment. Fresenius is no stranger to such lawsuits either. In 2016, Fresenius spent about $250 million to combat allegations from thousands of lawsuits that their treatments and their dialysis clinics directly resulted in cardiac problems and deaths, just like Davida. And more recently, in 2019, Fresenius paid about 200, over $200 million in criminal penalties following bribes to public officials abroad in hopes of monopolizing not just the US dialysis market, but the worldwide market as well. Clearly, based on these past lawsuits, allegations, uh, penalties, and settlements, Davida and Fresenius have very little incentive to actually raise awareness of CKD and prevent patients from going on dialysis in the first place. So, given this incredibly messy for-profit dialysis industry, and given the lack of awareness of CKD and the few distinguishing symptoms of CKD at the early stages, what exactly can we do? First, it's important to keep in mind, first it's important to keep in mind that although CKD is really under-discussed, this is not just the public's fault. Our for-profit-driven healthcare system allows companies like DeVita and Fresenius to monopolize the dialysis market resulting in very little incentive for these companies to actually care about raising awareness for CKD and preventing dialysis in the first place. So because of this, it becomes all the more important for us to support grassroots programs that raise awareness for CKD. Fortunately, there are already a lot of nonprofits that work on such issues, and I'm really proud to be a part of one of them, KDSAP, Kidney Disease Screening and Awareness Program. KDSAP is a nationwide 501c3 nonprofit that's run primarily by undergraduates at various universities around the country. At USC KDSAP, we provide educational events and free screenings so that people can get tested for CKD and learn more about CKD with us. We've been privileged enough to work with so many community organizations in the past few years and so many partners in Los Angeles that we've been able to work with over 1,500 families in Los Angeles and learning more about what CKD is and helping them get tested so that they can prevent costly and painful dialysis before it, even, before it even begins. By supporting organizations like KDSAP through coming to our educational events, attending our free screenings, or even by donating, we can, we can begin to ground these conversations at the community level. Having these conversations at the community level is so important, important in making sure that we educate not just ourselves, but all of the people around us in what CKD is and why we should care about this silent killer. Now, beyond just supporting organizations like KDSAP, there's a bunch of other things that we can do to help ourselves as well. For one, the next time you go to your doctor, consider asking for a UACR for an EGFR test. These are a urine albumin to creatinine ratio test and an estimated glomerular filtration rate test. Now I know these like are pretty weird big words, but 
Really what this boils down to is that these tests can help you and your doctor figure out if you might be at risk for CKD. These tests are especially important if you have a past history of hypertension, diabetes, or smoking, since these are major precursors and major, um, major things that can help contribute to your CKD. In addition to these tests, we can also help in other ways. On a more systemic level, as I've mentioned, it's so important that we raise awareness for CKD and help prevent dialysis in the first place. It's also so important that we help to curb, that we help to support bills that would curb Davida and Fresenius's efforts to further monopolize the dialysis market. CKD is a silent killer. But that doesn't mean we need to let these massive for-profit organizations silence us in raising awareness of this disease. We need to work together as a community to help raise awareness of CKD and help people prevent dialysis before, they, before it begins. In doing so, hopefully one day, patients like Kendra will not have to wait forever for their kidneys. Or maybe patients like Kendra will even have their CKD diagnosed at an early stage instead, helping them prevent dialysis altogether. Together, we can transform stories like Kendra's into powerful, emphatic motivators for change. My name is Mihir Kumar, and if there's one thing I want you to take away from today, it's that your kidneys matter too. Thank you so much for your time today.